Good morning and welcome to Appleton Christian Church. So glad you could join us today as we've come together to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I pray that as you go through the service, as you enjoy the praise, as you listen to the message, that you remember we're doing the same thing here at church and we're doing it in the presence of Jesus. And that means you are doing it in the presence of Jesus, we're doing it in the presence of Jesus. We're doing this together. You are part of a church. So as you enjoy this message, I just pray that it would bless you. And I pray also that you would hear what God is trying to say to you today. Have a great service.
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. For there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, for blessed be your name. You give and take away, you give Take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the glory of name. You know, as we continue our series in the book of Esther, I thought I'd start with a, a little background as well on the book. Now, one of the things that I found was kind of surprising is that there's a lot of discussion whether or not the book of Esther should even be in the Bible. Now, um, the Qumran sect, and those are the, that's the religious sect in Israel that hid the scriptures, we, we know in those pots, and, and we know them as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, it seems like the Qumran set didn't like the Book of Esther because there was no copy of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls found, at least up until this point in time. And there's some conjecture maybe why, and part of that had to do with the calendar and the, and the holiday uh, feast known as Purim, which they didn't necessarily see, that sect didn't necessarily see it as a religious holiday or something established by God. Now, in his commentary on Esther, uh, Mervyn uh, Brenneman, he, was, he said this, Throughout history, different opinions have been expressed concerning the canonical value of Esther. Now, canonical value means in canon. Canon basically means list of criteria. And the list of criteria of how something makes the Bible. So if something met that list, they would call it canonical. 
So here's Brenneman saying, expressing concern of canonical value of Esther. Now Luther was hostile to the book. Martin Luther was hostile and said he wished it did not exist. On the other hand, the medieval Jewish scholar Maimonides, um, from 1135 to 1204, he considered Esther the most important biblical book after the Pentateuch, and that's the first five books of your Bible. Now, uh, Brenneman goes on to write, what should our conclusion, what should be our conclusion? As Baldwin says, the book is in the canon. So we must decide what value it has for us and what should be our response. Its firm position in the Jewish canon and the consensus of Christian believers since the early church indicate that it should be considered part of the canon of scripture. We have no choice but to recognize and treat it as part of God's message to his people. And that's why we're studying it, because it's in the Bible, and God has something to teach us in it. You know, when I was a kid, I used to, um, I didn't always go to church on Sunday morning. In fact, probably from second grade to sixth grade, I stayed home. And I used to watch shows on Sunday morning like Davy and Goliath, but also one show that was very important to me, Superman. Now, the old TV show Superman, and I used to run around my neighborhood with a towel wrapped around my neck, flying like Superman did. And I don't know if you remember, it's the, the saying, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. Now, do you remember what he stood for? He stood for truth, justice, and the American way. And I thought about this this week, because as Christians, what do we stand for? What do we stand for? As we begin our third sermon covering the book of Esther, um, let's go to a quick review. First off, we know that Xerxes has taken power in Persia. He was king. He banished Queen Vashti, and four years later, he puts on a competition for a new queen. A young Jewish woman named Esther is promoted to be queen. And not only was she promoted, her adopted father, Mordecai, was also promoted. Let's continue reading in the book of in Esther, verses 20. Two, chapter 2, verses 20, 19 and 20. Now, when the virgins were assembled at the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do so. I told her to do. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. Now, Esther reads like a good novel. In fact, a lot of people have said, I've read Esther three times since we started this study. You just read it, and you can read it, and before you know, you're done with it. Now, there's protagonists, there's antagonists, twist in the plot, significant character development. In fact, that's what we talked about last week, that these people developed and grew um, throughout the book. Now, initially, Esther and Mordecai didn't stand for anything, but rather did whatever they had to to blend in and make, not make waves. And they were worldly in some way and actually passive in their beliefs. But all that changes when life throws Mordecai a curveball. Just like many of us have experienced, Mordecai finds himself in a situation where he has to choose, he has to decide what he's gonna stand for. Now, his situation was anything but normal. It seems that Mordecai had stumbled across a plot. It was a murder plot. Look at Esther 2, 21 through 23. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, Two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway became angry and conspired to assassinate the king. Basically what's going on, these guys have access to him. This death threat is a serious issue. And these eunuchs have inside access to the king and could have an opportunity to kill the king. Now this is like one of the president's cabinet members or, or somebody, one of his aides plotting to assassinate him. Plus many kings at that time were killed by those closest to him, Julius Caesar, in fact, 15 years after this event in the book, in our, in our book, Xerxes is actually assassinated by uh, Antrobanus, commander of his armies, and also with the help of another eunuch. Now, why did the eunuchs want to kill the king? We aren't sure, but power seems to attract its own issues. Now, one thing we know for sure, though, Mordecai is the only one who can stop the murder plot. So Mordecai is at the gate. He's at the king's gate, so he's probably an official of some sort. And the king has taken his own and only adopted daughter and made her queen. Now he hears his plot to assassinate the king, and what should he do? I mean, Xerxes is clearly evil. He has killed many people. Mordecai probably thinks Xerxes maybe even deserves to die. 
but he is really the kind of person that Mordecai should stand up for. Let's see what Mordecai does. Verse 22, but Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were hanged on a gallows, and all this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. So Mordecai decided to tell the king about the plot saving his life, and the two plotting eunuchs are killed uh, by being impaled on an upright log. And we're left with this question, why did Mordecai want to save Queen Xerxes, King Xerxes? Maybe it was selfish to get the head in the kingdom, and there's probably more to gain if the king was assassinated in one respect. Plus, there's this risk. You imagine he's accused, accusing two guards or two people that are close to the king, and what if they just deny it? And now he's accused of accusing them. So I don't think he did it for selfish reasons. In fact, why did he save a man that had conquered many lands, killed thousands, and thrown these ridiculous parties we talked about in the first week? He stopped the assassination plot, uh, uh, the assassination plot, I think because it was the right thing to do. You know, in a modern day applications, Christians should stand up for all people, even, even the wicked, because it's the right thing to do. What would you do in Mordecai's situation? You may not work for the president or have an opportunity to stand up for those who experience injustice, but what should we do? Well, Jesus actually tells us in Luke 6, verse 36 and 37, you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Because we're called to show grace, compassion, and forgiveness to everyone, including the coworker who makes crude jokes, your neighbor who plays the music too loud, the family member who just always tries to hurt you. And it can be really hard to do. You know, wicked people often, oftentimes do deserve the punishment for their wickedness, in fact, but it isn't really our place um, to give them that punishment. We should take a stand for anybody being treated wrong because it is the right thing to do. Imagine um, where we would be if Jesus only helped those who deserved it. <laughs> History offers examples of godly people taking a stand of those who may seem like they don't deserve it. In Genesis, Joseph is sold in, into slavery by his brothers and where he works as a slave and is eventually even sent to prison. But years later, during a famine, his brothers come to Egypt in dire need of food and how did Joseph respond? Well, by this time, Joseph was the second in the kingdom. And how did he respond? Well, he did respond with grace, compassion, forgiveness. In Genesis 37, we read how he met with him. And in Genesis 45, we read how he wept and introduced himself to him. And, and he wept him with joy and he provided for all their family needs. Guys, there are times we must stand up for people when things that we disagree with even or that we believe don't deserve it. We must rise above our personal judgments and show the love and justice God has given us. Let's continue on to Esther 3. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agag Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than all of the other nobles. Now, what we need to understand, it's been about five years since Esther was made queen. And our antagonist that is introduced, this big bad guy in the story is Haman. And Haman is a descendant of Agag. Now, Agag was the king of the Amalekites. And there, um, these were Israel's sworn enemy for generations. And Haman became the right-hand man for King Xerxes. Now, it was not uncommon to have that happen people from other nations becoming in a high position in the kingdom. Joseph was Pharaoh's right-hand man. We talked about him. Daniel was Nebuchadnezzar's right-hand man. Now Haman, it wields great power under Xerxes. But unlike Joseph and Daniel, Haman was power hungry. He was a bit egotistical like his boss, Xerxes. Look at verse two. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him but Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Now there's a lot of debate on why Mordecai wouldn't do it. You know, some people say bowing to Haman was worship and Mordecai 
wouldn't worship him because of what um, he was honoring the first commandment. You should not worship anybody else but God. Now, some say maybe it was because Haman was an Amalekite and there was hatred that I mentioned earlier. Others say it was just a sign of respect like saluting a superior officer and he didn't respect him so he wouldn't bow. Now, we can't know for sure, but that's really not the question I have. My question is this, why does Mordecai like take a stand now? He didn't stand for God when um, he chose to live in Persia. Remember, he had an opportunity to go back and live in, in Israel and he didn't stand then. He didn't take a stand when they were taking his daughter away. He didn't take a stand for his people or his heritage, choosing to hide his ethnicity and, and telling Esther to do so as well. But now suddenly he's taking a very dangerous stand against Haman. And you just, you just don't ignore the king's right-hand man and expect to escape unpunished. And he had to know his life was in danger here. In fact, he, we wouldn't understand that if he risked his life to save Esther, but he didn't. And instead he's risking his life because he wouldn't show respect to a superior governor, uh, government officer. And it didn't go unnoticed. Look at verse three. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated for he had told them he was a Jew. These are Mordecai's co-workers and they're bugging him about his obvious lack of respect. In fact, they speak to him up day after day and Mordecai won't budge. So like any good office gossips, they spread dissension. They go up and they talk to Haman about this to see if Mordecai's conduct would be accepted. And since Mordecai had told him he was a Jew, he had to tell him that too. Haman, we just thought, we just thought you should know that Mordecai, this guy has been saying about you and I don't want, I don't want, I don't know what his problem is. Well, and now suddenly his religious, ethnic identity comes into play. These guys, these office gossips won't bow, says he won't bow because he's a Jew. So it says there, now here's, here's the problem. It's either I'm Jewish and I won't bow and worship to a mere man, or I'm Jewish and I won't bow because the Amalekites are enemies because he brings out and he makes it a point he's Jewish and that's why he won't bow. So what did the office gossip say to Haman? And by the way, did you know he was a Jew? Now, either way, he wasn't bowing. And why did Mordecai play the religious card now? After all this time of hiding his race and religion, it finally comes out. And for all these years that he has hidden his faith, he finally speaks up. In his mind, this is the situation that demanded him to take a stand. And sometimes, you know, when we think about Christians, we take a stand against wicked people or actions because it's the right thing to do. And that's true. But I think it's interesting how we treat this in our own Christian lives. Because someone is telling a filthy joke and we don't laugh at it or we kind of laugh a little bit because Jesus wouldn't think it funny, so I don't want to laugh a lot. Someone's talking about their beliefs, their religion, and we just listen we, without sharing our belief in Christ. You know, like I, I don't want to offend anybody. Often we say nothing about our God or our Savior or our beliefs and we don't weigh in on discussions of right and wrong. But then a situation or circumstances arises in our lives and we just can't take it. We finally speak up, just like Mordecai. Often we, and often we finally speak up on an interesting occasion. In fact, I gotta tell you, we say nothing about Jesus to our coworkers for years, but then we decide to take a stand on something like gay marriage. And the office gossips say, oh, he's a Christian. And we say nothing about grace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ to our family and friends, but we get real upset when our cousin starts living with his girlfriend in sin. Of all the battles that Mordecai could have fought, he decided that this was the hill that he was willing to die on. Now we can debate on whether he was right or wrong, wise or foolish to do so, but you know what? He did stand for something, and he refused to compromise or go with the flow. There was a wicked man doing wicked things, and he was being simply pressured to join in, and he simply said no. He didn't lecture, he didn't protest, he didn't blow Haman up on Facebook. He just refused to do the thing that everyone else was doing. And that's part of what it means to live for God in a godless culture. Now that's part of, 
You know, there are some things that are just off limits for us. We're not slaves to religious rules. We're not party poopers or wet blankets. Guys, we've been set free from our sins. And we will not sacrifice that freedom to go right back into the chains. And so we take a stand. Some Christians fight all the wrong battles and speak up too often. And some Christians don't fight battles at all. And they're often, they're quiet too often. But we will all have those moments when we are faced with the decision to make and, and, and when there's no gray area or, or just blend into. You know, there's times when our options are black and white, choice A or B. No middle ground, no compromise, no way out. And we are left with the choice to either sit down and, and take it or to stand up for what is right. And Mordecai finally shows some courage to take a stand and Haman didn't stand for it. Look at verse five. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. So in the 12th year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, they cast up the, the poor, that is the lot, in the presence of Haman to select a day and month. And the lot fell on the 12th month, the month of Adar. Now, in, on our, in our calendar, this incident took place in April, and the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. And Haman hasn't even consulted the king, but he was so confident that he starts to plan the extermination even before discussing it with the king. They rolled dice to see the day, to choose which day the Jews would be killed. Now, by the way, I, in my studies, I found out that they used to throw dice like that a lot in the kingdoms in those times. Now, verse 8, Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There's a certain people dispersed and scattered among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom, whose customs are different from those of all other people, and who do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. Now, Haman's basically misleading the king. Yes, they have different laws, but nothing says nobody says they weren't following the king's laws. Many of them were likely following it, given the command we read a few weeks ago, from Jeremiah when Jeremiah the prophet told the people that God said, work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I send you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for it is well, for its welfare will determine your welfare. You know, so really, who was really doing it? It was only Mordecai that wasn't bowing. Let's go to verse nine. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them and I will put 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury for the men who carry out this business. That's a huge sum of money. It's like $5 million. And he would actually probably be taking that from the plunder of the murdered Jews. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Amadatha, and Aga, the Aga, Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, Haman, and do with the people as you please. Now, after being saved by a Jewish man, Xerxes doesn't hesitate in allowing their annihilation. You know, it's some ruler to imagine the president of allowing someone to do that. Like, um, I don't like left-handed people. Let's just kill all the left-handed people. It says, oh, okay, let's do it. And we see the Persians were upset by this too. Um, look at verse 12. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned and they wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people, all Haman's orders to the king's satraps the governors of the various provinces and the nobles of the various peoples. And these were written in the name of the king Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. Spurred on by the king's command, the couriers went out and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. And the king and Haman, Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Look at that again. What did they do? The king sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Imagine every single Jewish person in the whole empire was to be murdered. Every two-year-old child 
to 80 year old grandmas, pregnant mothers, everyone. It'd be probably around 15 million people murdered in a single day. Now this is a shock to the people of Susa and the capital and just so it would be to us. And how do you, how do you think they, Haman and, and the king responded? It's just, they sat down and drank, just had a couple beers. Guys, taking a stand can be costly. You know, I, I thought about even in our own state, years ago, back in 1999, um, Columbine, the Columbine shootings, Cassie Burnell, um, when the two seniors came and started shooting people, um, it basically came out that they asked Cassie, says, do you still believe in God? And she said, yeah. And so they shot her. She was faced with death, but she refused to denounce God, knowing God was her eternal salvation. Now, Mordecai took a stand, and it was very costly. He was taking a stand and making a statement against an evil man, knowing there would be a cost. Now, taking a stand can come in many forms. Opposing evil, refusing to participate in idolatry, and that means like of money and careers or our image. We need to take a stand sometimes by professing our faith. Or simply being nice to someone, saying hello to someone looking to, that everybody else looks down to. Or inviting a new guy over for dinner. At times, taking a stand be, can be costly. We can be embarrassed, we can lose our job, we can even be harmed. God will always be at work when we take a stand in his name. Now from this passage, we also learn that taking a stand, not taking a stand when we should, can also be costly. Because if Esther had said that she was Jewish... And, and King Xerxes had known she was Jewish, and Haman had known she was Jewish, I don't know if Haman would have done this. And give me, let me give you another example. In 1 Samuel, Saul was commanded to kill all the Amalekites when he was, when he was to attack them and not letting any, any, any of them live. But Saul didn't follow through with that. He kept their stuff, he kept, even kept the king alive. So here we are, hundreds of years later, and Saul's descendant, remember Mordecai's Saul's descendant, they're paying the price for his inaction because if Saul had done what God had told him and killed all the Amalekites, Haman wouldn't be there. So there can also be cost of not taking a stand for God. Now the ultimate example of someone taking a stand, of course, is Jesus Christ. Jesus took a stand for all of us, taking the punishment for our sins and paying the cost of crucifixion. He did this so we could have a free gift of salvation. He did this for the forgiveness of sin and, the, and our admission into the heavenly kingdom. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we now have the opportunity to take the most important stand of our lives by accepting him as our Lord and our Savior and receiving the free gift of salvation and forgiveness. Now many people, many of us probably have already taken that stand. And we can take a stand in our day-to-day -day lives too. We can stand against injustice evil, idolatry, and hate, and standing for forgiveness and kindness and charity and compassion. Those things are so needed right now. And as we take a stand, others will see it and, and may come to know Jesus Christ because of our stand. Now, there are some Christians that take a stand on everything, and they, they really are ready to die on every hill, and they make waves everywhere they go, and they're proud of it. I don't read that necessarily in Scripture. I, I'm, I'm that that we cause a wave every time, but more more often the case, you know, is that some of us have gotten too comfortable with our silence and we never stand up and we never speak up. I think if there's a problem with American Christians, is is that we don't speak up enough. Mordecai and Esther were ashamed of their identity initially. They were scared of what people would say and what people would do if they knew. Now that's changing. Bob Moorhead, Dr. Bob Moorhead um, wrote this, and I wanted to share it with you. If you want a copy of it, just let us know, I'll send it to you. He says this, Christians, we must never be ashamed of who we are. We are those who have stood up and been counted as followers of Christ. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast, I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus, of Christ Jesus. I won't look back, let up, slow down, and back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, chintzy giving, and dwarfed goals. 
I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by presence, learn by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my compassions my companions few, my guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, and ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander at the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. As we come together, We understand there's times to take a stand. And I pray, I pray that God would touch you in that way. And I pray that as we've come together as believers and and start seeing the development of, of Mordecai and Esther in their character, that we would appreciate that God has promised never to leave us or forsake us. And he's also promised to complete the good work in us. Have a great week.
Good morning. Welcome and I pray you're having a blessed day. I want to read to you from Hebrews the 12th chapter as we focus our minds on this communion time. This, these verses say, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. The joy set before him. What is that joy? To me, it's the joy of knowing the eternal relationship that he's giving to all of us by his death on the cross. What more could we ask? Join me in prayer as we pray for these emblems. Father, we thank you that because of that joy, because of that eternal love, Jesus came and went through the life that he went through. He endured that cross, endured that suffering, the humiliation, the literal curse that you put on anyone hung on the tree. Father, bless these emblems. Help us to remember it's his body and his blood that are our redemption, that are our eternal relationship with you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm so glad you could. We covered a pretty tough subject, and that's standing for him. This week, we have an opportunity to be him to others. And I pray that as you walk, you would let people see Jesus in you. If you need anything, don't forget, call the church. We'll pray for you. We'll reach out to you. And as we come together, I, I appreciate again that you've joined us. Have a great week in Christ.